Well, Daniel, thank you so much for uh, helping my project. Uh, could you say a little bit about yourself? Sure. My name is Daniel Borden. I'm currently living in Tiverton, Rhode Island. I'm a mechanical engineering major at the Community College of Rhode Island. And I'm very interested in the space industry and in seeing humanity become a multi-planetary civilization with settling on the moon and Mars and beyond one day. Yeah, definitely gonna require lots of uh, mechanical engineering to make that happen, both to get us there and the structures to live in. Um, which, uh, which part of it fascinates you most? What got you into mechanical engineering? The funny thing you mentioned about that, when I actually started college back in 2014, it's been a push. So originally, I was going into astronomy. I got an interest in radio astronomy and other types of that. And I didn't want to go into engineering because I thought it was too difficult. But here I am wanting to do the astronomy and physics kind of thing. But back in 2016, there was a nice announcement by Elon Musk called the BFR of wanting to send humans to Mars by 2024, which now that timeline has changed with delays and recently named Starship. And I was starting to get ideas that I really like solving complex problems and really wanting to find that. And I went through a program through the NASA Community College Aerospace Scholars Program, NASA NCAS, where I went, got to go to an on-site experience for a week at Stennis Space Center, where I happened to luck out I don't remember the exact engine number, but I believe it might be being used for Artemis 1 currently. I'm not too sure, but I got to see the engine test live in person, which that was a complete fluke of luck. And it really got me thinking that, let me try some other stuff. Try the NASA plus Space Academy through the Lucy mission. I'm doing the Rascal competition where I'm designing a part of a team, a Mars Ascent vehicle. And it just, it really pushes me between beyond my boundaries of what I want to do. That is uh, really awesome. And is it mainly, uh, I mean, like before Elon uh, talked about BFR uh, back in 2016, uh, did you have any interest in space? Yes. So I am part of a, uh, amateur astronomy society called the Astronomical Society of Southern New England. And I had a big, big thing about wanting to look at stars, solar system, and all of that, and even attended a annual convention called Stella Fame, brought, hosted by the Springfield Telescope Makers in Springfield, Vermont, which is the country's old, oldest continuous running star park. And just seeing all that, the vast amount of emptiness there in space, but it's really not empty. And it just boggles my mind. Um, as a, an astronomy um, a person, you must be really excited about the James Webb Telescope actually maybe uh, getting in orbit this year. Yes. I have been following that for years and I'm just like shocked and I'm thinking, okay, is it going to be another delay? I, I just got so, I think the whole community got used to it. I just hope when it launches, it launches without complications. And because there have been people that have spent their entire careers on that one instrument. And we want to make sure it really gets up there. And that also reminds me about Hubble where NASA wants to, from what I understand, decommission it. Why don't someone like SpaceX's Elon Musk or other commercial enterprises send their rockets up there with astronauts and fix it like they used to? Because that's a great piece of scientific instrument. It should go to waste and burn up in the atmosphere. And do you know uh, what's wrong with Hubble that would need to be fixed? Is it like the gyroscopes or is it computational stuff or... Uh... The last time that I was looking at this, it seemed to be something with the gyroscopes where they can only point in certain directions. And since shuttle was retired, NASA hasn't 
sent astronauts to actually fix it because it's at a different orbit than the ISS is. Yeah, those uh, gyroscopes um, are probably the, I mean, the number of revolutions they've probably done over their lifespan is probably in the hundreds of billions, I imagine. Um, in some way, we need to figure out some way to create a gyroscope that, that can last for hundreds and thousands of years. Oh, definitely. That would be great, but even with all instrumentation, it, they need proper maintenance. And so 2016, uh, BFR uh, announcement, um, you're talking about the IAC in Guadalajara? The, yes, I believe it was that conference that was announced at. Did you, did you get a go? No, unfortunately I didn't get to go, but I did hear about it online and watched portions of the conference that was uploaded to YouTube. Yeah, that's, it's, it's really nice that, uh, you know, now you can, regardless uh, if you go to a conference or not, you can see it on, on, online. Um, so uh, I guess, uh, first off, um, when did you find out that we were planning to send astronauts uh, to the moon in 2024? I found out at some point it was, I can't remember if it was 2018 or 2019 now. Hold on. Oh, it was 2019 was when former Vice President Mike Pence announced it and his initiatives in one of the, I think it was a Space Council meeting, if I recall correctly, where they were announcing we are going to Artemis. I was actually watching that meeting live when they were announcing the Artemis program. And I was like, wow, this is, is this actually going to happen? Because I've always been hearing, we're going to go back to the moon. We're going to go back to the moon. But it's like 2028, 20, 2030. 20, it's like, we can do it sooner than that. Yeah, indeed. Um, and are you still hopeful that we're, we're going to uh, make it to the moon? I think we can still make it to the moon. But now it's more of a question of who's going to get there first in 2024, SpaceX or NASA? Because NASA has had budget issues in the past and we have the change of administrations, but it is promising with the new administration as the space rock that's on loan from the Smithsonian in the overall office and everyone's going hyped up about that. But it was unfortunate to seem um, Jim Burdenstein stepped down because he seemed to be one of the most popular NASA administrators in recent history. But even though we have that transition, the idea is still living on about the Artemis program and it's building off its sister, Apollo, uh, sister, brother, Apollo. And uh, yeah, Jim Bridenstine seemed to be all fired up about us going back to the moon and really pushing uh, the contractors to deliver. And it was disappointing to me too to see him kind of step away. But you know, now he's over at that private equity firm uh, helping to um, kind of direct investment into various uh, space companies. Uh, so it, it seems seems he might still play a, a role in, in some respects. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't hear about that. I'll definitely have to take a look at that. And I do also know about, they announced yesterday with uh, Axiom, the first set of private citizen astronauts that will be going to the International Space Station. That was a nice little surprise. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. And hopefully they'll be sending, uh, you know, a mission a year and then two missions a year and then three or four or five and just keep going up and up and up. Hopefully the price goes down and down and down. I, I <laughs> need it uh, to, well, to become more affordable. An interesting observation I did make the other day. It was sometime this, the last several days ago, I can't remember the exact day. There's a YouTuber named Mr. Beast or Jimmy Donaldson. I don't know if you know who he is. I don't know who he is, but I saw his, I'll send your image to the moon for $10. Yes, it was interesting that he, during that, that live stream, which I watched most of it, he went over 52 million 
subscribers. What I find interesting, going back to what you were asking about before, about if we can still get there in 2024, you have social media influencers like Mr. Beast promoting something like this has never been, what he's doing is unprecedented for someone of, of a social media influencer purchasing a hard drive to put on, they keep, they kept interchanging Lander and Rover, and I guess still got to look into which one's being sent later this year because they're, they're two different instruments. It's a Lander. Um, oh, it's inc incidentally, um, I've also paid uh, Astrobotic to send this one. Oh, you can't see it because of the uh, oh, I can see a bit. virtual background. I'll turn that off. Oh, I guess uh, it's not so bad. Um, but I, I've I've paid Astro so Astrobotic is one of uh, NASA's commercial lunar and payload services providers. Them and Intuitive Machine are both slated to carry instruments to the moon for um, NASA this year. Uh, and NASA basically is paying them to deliver their instruments. They have to figure out what rocket to launch it on, build the lander and do everything else. But if there's any remaining capacity, you know that's all up to that company to do. Astrobotic is doing a promotion with uh, DHL, the package delivery firm. I call the DHL moon box and um, private citizens like you and me uh, can go and buy a DHL moon box and essentially send whatever we want to with inside of that, that size. Um, so about $500, I can send um, a, a micro SD card uh, to the moon. Um, and this video is actually going to be on this card. So you're going to the moon uh, and um, you know, I got a one terabyte card here. So that's sort of, he's, he is uh, essentially doing the, uh, doing that um, is my understanding. It's a very interesting thing because that was actually a nice surprise there. I appreciate it. Because <laughs> sometime within the next month uh, before the thing expires with Mr. Beast as well, I'll be doing that $10 thing, upload a second video or photo to go to the moon. But seeing something like what with, what you're doing, what Jimmy Donaldson's doing and other people around the world, you have the everyday astronaut. There are some folks I probably don't even, oh, astronaut Abby and other people can't think of off the top of my hand, the head for the moment. This didn't exist, this kind of platform back in the sixties. So there's public pressure now really at a higher bar of having humans sent back to the moon. But what's a pressing challenge is also showcasing what the space industry can do to help solve challenges on Earth. Because there are some still folks that are still in denial that, why are we going to space, spending billions of dollars on this? We have problems we can't fix on Earth. And every time I hear that, I'm, I, I cringe because I'm like, there are things in space that can be solved in space that help on Earth. But yes, I've heard uh, both of those quite a bit. Uh, regarding that second one, uh, you know, I, I definitely think like space-based solar power is, I mean, whenever you consider like one 700 billionth of the sun's energy actually falls on the earth, you realize we pretty much have an infinite amount of energy that we could get from the sun. If only we had the infrastructure to capture it and utilize it. Uh, so I, I think that's that's pretty much a, a very solid thing. But in terms of other things from space that will help the Earth, what comes to your mind? What comes to my mind for that are uh, different types of experiments where you can, for like example, there's some particular things that are developed in space with like experiments that they can really help on earth. I'm just trying to think of some off the top of my head. I haven't, I haven't thought about this in a bit. So my bad. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's the real challenge for space advocates and for people who uh, don't see the benefit is uh, we really should have uh, a list of very specific uh, things that have impactful. You know, one thing that's kind of interesting is like the um, made in space is making uh, fiber optic cables uh, that are of a much higher quality than can be made here on Earth. Um, that that 
seems like that might show some promise. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a real challenge because I, I think a lot of people have a lot of hope. I think uh, the uh, Apollo program definitely had a big impact. But space right now, the way we approach it through NASA and, and everything, I mean, they're not using the leading edge computers. They're not really pushing the envelope. Uh, they're not generating out the same number of engineers that they used to. It was interesting you said about the fiber optic cable made in space. That's what we need. And I think that could be a good thing for space enthusiasts to advocate about. You see product labels made in USA, made in China, made in Japan, all those other countries. We need labels that say made in space. I think that could be a good thing to really push for. Yeah, uh, that that could be kind of interesting. And the other thing is, you know, the UN uh, meets in um, New York, but can you imagine at some point uh, the UN actually being in orbit and you have all these world uh, delegates like actually seeing the earth outside their conference window and, and you know, they're kind of, you know, it's really visible to them that, uh, you know, the globe is, is really an entity that's completely separate from the labels that we put on it. Kind of reminds me of like the Justice League almost. <laughs> he said that in orbit, I'm like, interesting. But you know, that is actually an interesting idea because you have things in space already they're helping. They have satellites, which is helping for crops or the farmers helping predict weather patterns. Everything's coming back to me for that now. But it's, you have internet, which has blossomed in the last decade. Yesterday, you had SpaceX announcing their new Starlink network to have 10 gigabyte download speeds very soon instead of the one gigabyte one. And that's just unbelievable, it's disrupting entire industries and it's getting us more connected. But at the same time, you need to have these other things. But I would say when you have politicians on earth and they're fighting over this minuscule things, you just want to take them, throw them in the rocket, have them go into space. Someone said this, so very close to this. I think I'm probably paraphrasing this and have them turn around and look at this. And this is what they're arguing about. I don't see a wall there. I don't see boundaries. It's just one planet. But you know, uh, politicians um, aren't just uh, political people. I mean, not political people, but I guess what I mean is they're not just, uh, you know, some type of independent, devoid thing. They're like hooked into this web of, of their existence. And that thing that may look very kind of niche to us is, you know, one of their, their funders key points, the whole reason that they've gotten the, the money or something important to a constituent or something they think is important to kind of their place, or maybe they're trying to limit something else, you know, it's like, uh, there's all these other factors, factors at play uh, with uh, politicians. Oh, definitely. And money is unfortunately one of those driving factors but they need, if you were to create a huge investment in space, one of the first things beyond building the fundamentals of a moon base on the moon should be the designation on the far side of the moon of the largest radio telescope ever conceived of. So we would have no interference coming from different wave and frequencies and also the push to finish Lisa, which is from the um, the next generation LIGO gravitational wave detector. Yeah, it'd be interesting to be able to detect something at this uh, scale of um, suns and planets. You know, I mean, can you imagine being able to detect uh, gravitational waves uh, just from uh, things other than massive uh, super black holes uh, orbiting each other and lighting definitely be interesting to see how that goes forward but what we're still anticipating is probably at least 15 years before lisa gets 
built and hopefully operational by then. And I'm really hoping for something with the um, radio telescope, but first they got to rebuild the one in uh, Puerto Rico. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess, um, you know, why not just forget about the one in Puerto Rico and, and focus on the one on the far side of the moon? There could be arguments for both sides on that. However, there is benefit of rebuilding the one in Puerto Rico. So I, I know some of the uh, people that actually were advocating for the rebuilding and the whole effort of save the, that observatory. The idea behind having it that we built is not for education, it's for opportunity. Because a lot of Puerto Rico, it's not everywhere is above living standards. There are areas that are below poverty. It's some of the only chances they might have. They're not, they're not an integrated US state yet. So they're kind of semi cut off from everything, but not in a way. So it's, it gives opportunities for STEM education. So I, having those telescopes, like a radio on earth will always have its place and where it's strategically located. However, if you really want to extend the research and rediscover all more things, build a humongous one on the far side of the moon. Where you have a moon, you could then have multiple moon bases. You'd have a moon base on the side facing earth, and then you could have another one. And when you think of the gateway program, you could have gateway transport astronauts from one base to the other. Hmm. Yeah, no, that sounds like a, a good thing. Um, you know, you, you learned about uh, our plans to go back to the moon in 2024, right as they were announced. Uh, like you were one of the first people to have heard about it. Um, I've talked to people through these interviews starting back in December 17, 2019. So over a year at this point. And the vast majority of non-space people, the people that I interview on the street, at the coffee shops, on uh, the stores and what have you, I'd say as many as 80% of them didn't know we were planning to go to the moon. In fact, some of them even thought that NASA was shut down. Our, and others thought um, we were, that's where astronauts went uh, every time they blasted off. Um, what, why do you think uh, so few like everyday people know that we're going to the moon? One thing I think about that is because people are stuck multitude of answers, but if I were to try to like take a sample of the majority, it's probably that they don't have interest. They are too focused on their lives because there are issues going on where they just, there could be issues of money issues, poverty, other things going on. They could also not lack the possibilities of even being able to see stuff like that, being able to get access to the internet. Then there are just people that just clearly don't care for that. Again, that's just kind of a generalization, what I think, but it's a matter of perspective because someone could see, oh, they're going to the moon. Okay, like when I read a news article of some random new frog species they just found. I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. And then, then it could be like 10,000 people. Oh my gosh, this is the best thing that happened since sliced bread. Pun intended right there. I think that's where the difference is, but getting more awareness so we can get more people hyping it up. That's where this time I think will be a lot more successful because we had the thing how we connected with the Space Heroes new TV show. So you trying to get that public persuasion and getting more people aware through a new venue. It sounds like uh, one thing we might consider doing is taking those new frog species and seeing them in space and seeing how they, they do. <laughs> that would be interesting. <laughs> Uh, so you bring up Space Heroes. Uh, how did you find out about that? Randomly. By chance, 
I was scrolling through my Facebook account one day and I just saw an article about it back in this past fall and it was a complete chance encounter, but I guess it was a good one, so. And, um, you know, I've talked to some people at NASA and uh, they are, they don't actually work for NASA, they work for some of their contractors. Uh, one of them does the, um, the actual scheduling of the astronauts time and space and he on one hand he was kind of excited to have this public engagement opportunity but on the other hand he was kind of doubtful of uh, sending a reality tv star uh, to the international space station and i mean what's your sort of take on that i believe that was johnny depp who's supposed to be going to the ISS in it, like a year for a movie. But seeing an actual movie filmed in space, I think is an excellent point to get the general consensus of, we're becoming a spacefaring civilization. We're not up there with Star Trek or Star Wars yet. That, that's, I'd say it's a millennia maybe away if we get that far, let's hope one day. But for now, where we are in the 21st century, we have, been in low Earth orbit, spent some time on the moon and the Apollo missions, sent stuff to almost every planet in the solar system. Actually, I think every planet at this point in the solar system, probes at least, not humans. But we're at the point where we're readying to send humans to Mars, which is very far away, an entire other planet on its own. Now we have the moon but the only thing about the moon is no atmosphere and it's only about 250,000 plus miles away from us. We can see it almost every day when we look up into the sky. But Mars looks like a star, in the moon. but it's just you have something that far. You need that momentum of the, we need to explore everything because we've explored most of the surface of the earth, very little of the bottom of the ocean, but then we have the great vast cosmos. It's more about human exploration and trying to find the unknown, find the spirited enough to do that. Yeah, I've heard that uh, too, that we actually know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the bottom of the ocean. Um, you know, I, what would it take to explore more of the ocean, I guess? Political will. <laughs> we have the technology to do it. I'd say it's political will at this point. I mean, it seems like, uh, you know, having some places where humans can live underneath the ocean would be uh, a great way to protect humanity from radiation and everything else it's got to be um, it's got to be uh, you know kind of a, a neat neat thing um so you're interested in going to space yourself that's uh, why you're participating in space heroes ideally that's why I well, actually I joined I applied for the insider hero program and I happened to get into it However, I'm, I'm looking to be taking a different route where I was actually got a callback interview for potentially one of the uh, 20 leadership positions within the 400 of the first cohort, cohort. And I met with Deborah and Thomas last week to discuss that. And doing certain other things would actually make me ineligible for competing of like going like deeper into the organization. And I'm actually thinking of going more that route than actually doing the competition. Now, I'm not saying I wouldn't go into space. Trust me, I want to go into space. But my biggest focus right now is wanting to, you have the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. They're goals. It's great and all. But the United Nations itself has lost a lot of power over the decades. There were an answer post-World War II, so countries wouldn't repeat what happened after World War I to World War II. 
but there's the political system around the world are all ever changing. And they're, the goals, they're great, but there's no clear path of making it practical. It, like some could say, oh, I'm recycling a water bottle. That goes towards this sustainability goal. And they could advertise it to the end of the world. But at the end of the day, how much of an impact would that have? That's where I'm trying to research solutions right now, where what kind of impact can that be done? And I've been having some conversations with uh, Deborah and Thomas about that, but we'll see where that goes. I often thought, um, you know, if you want people to recycle like plastic, if they can have a device in their house where they can actually transform that plastic into something usable that they need, then you suddenly have the motivation is like flipped around. Instead of collecting um, plastic bottles and plastic containers and what have you uh, to, because you think it's, it's a good thing, you're now doing it because you can actually turn into something useful. Um, I mean, if you look around your house, you probably have lots of fairly simple plastic things, you know, containers, um, pots, uh, plants, uh, the little uh, uh, ring that holds up the shower curtain, the, um, um, I'm just kind of looking around, you know, the little, the little bottom of like the little tables, uh, coasters, you know, these are like a fairly simple the de de devices. What if you could take plastic, put it into a device, it gets split out into the different types of plastic it is, and then it's able to mold or create anything you want uh, out of that. And after you get done using it, you throw it back into the device, you create something else. Actually, interesting you say that because that actually already exists. It's something called precious plastic, which we created someone in Denmark called Dave Hawk. But the precious plastic is you have these different type of machines where you could take a plastic water bottle like this. Yep. And you can shred it and you it made into 3D printing filament. You could bake it and mold it into different things. But the problem is still it's set up like industrial type of thing. When you where you've seen how metal 3D printers or CNC manufacturing processes go, it's more on the industrial still. It hasn't evolved point where, oh, I have this little module 3D printer I can buy for $500 at Costco and have it on my kitchen to print stuff. It, now, precious plastic needs to evolve from the point of being in a warehouse space to, I could have it in you know, my own room kind of thing. But there are certain things, though, you still do with it, like baking it. It could create different kind of uh, gases that go into the air because you're basically melting down plastic, <laughs> the fumes. So that's, there's certain things in there that still have to have precautions, but the idea of taking that module, and then you have a simple idea like that. And then what if you put it into like a makerspace? And that's where my research reached me right now. And actually, thank you for bringing that up because I didn't even think about that till now. So I just brainstormed with you an entire new idea. And I'm just like, I got to write that down. Oh, you need to do more than write it down. You need to make it happen. <laughs> yes. So then you have the makerspace concept. How can a makerspace evolve over time? Well, with makerspaces, it's been known to become a community where you have action going on. You, oh, 3D printing, these tutorial workshops, a nice little community in the center part of town or if it's in a city. It has some potential. Looking back on Dave Hawking, though, you see an idea of let's have this community. He just evolved his precious plastic, a community to do other stuff. I'm on his discord server that's done that. And actually we'll bring that up right now. So I know what I'm referencing exactly. So his discord server, he renamed it one on where he does stuff for gets feedback. He has different regions so people can communicate from around the world. And it's just amazing how he said he has a, a selling page where you can sell stuff, you want to sort things. The idea is to take something like that in a makerspace 
and think about how it could work in different countries where you think of it in an academy or university where you have this product, which is your degree. You go there to get a degree, get an education, move on. Something like this is more of a get a practical answer thing done without going. It's not undermining the degree process. It's more of the direct answers from the community looking for that unique individuals in those areas and really getting those kind of answers. Then you get an actual, I'm actually going to be a guest on this one in the near future at the University of Colorado Boulder. There is this class called Pathways to Space from CU Boulder, where this professor has a non-traditional class, which is kickoff for their space minor for the students, mm. where sometimes he would dress up as like Superman or from Star Trek, and it, they'd set up the room, and it, the way they do it, it gets people so interested and invested in space. It's a unique solution, and it's stuff like that. You need to find unique solutions to these problems, and I'm getting all these ideas together and making something hopefully good out of it. And that's where I think we could derive what that frame being built off, derive the solutions that are needed for stuff like the climate, climate crisis and other things. Absolutely. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, yeah, maybe uh, just standardizing on a, a, a type of plastic that is easy to melt and mold. I mean, like, for example, you have uh, the plastic that like those laundry bottles are made out of that melts of a much lower temperature doesn't produce fumes. But then you have like the clear plastic bottles, which melt at a higher temperature do produce fumes. And on top of that, the little ring in the cap is made out of a different type of plastic. So it's almost like, um, you know, if we could just uh, kind of get it into one type of plastic that's easy to remold and reuse, that would be a big step. They don't have to do as much separation. And then you have these machines that are able to cut them up, clean them, uh, turn them into filament, put it into a 3D printer, 3D print whatever it is you want. That would be kind of a good way to, to proceed. Be even better if the industry stops using plastic <laughs> in a lot of things. Or, well, I mean, plastic is, uh, you know, waterproof, flexible, tough, light, has a lot of good qualities going for it. Um, uh, you know, the, I think the biggest problem is just um, having, uh, you know, so many types of plastic and then not not reusing it in, in short cycles. How do, how do you clean the plastic is another big thing. You know, getting the, the labels off and uh, getting the residue off of it is like uh, critical. Definitely is. Well, I really appreciate your time. Is there, um, I have to check out this precious pl plastic uh, uh, stuff, uh, but is there anything else you wanted to talk about that we didn't get to? One other thing, I definitely appreciate everything you're doing with this initiative of having an interview every day until someone lands on the moon. I'm just, it'd be great to see this incorporated somehow with the, um, space heroes in a way to even get more people because it would be great one day to get the uh, exposure of this program you're doing at a much higher level to like even a worldwide kind of audience because then it could really the momentum would definitely gain because how how long have you been doing this for um a little over 400 days uh december 17 uh, was when i started in 2019 and then last year, um, you know, in December, the Chronicle, I thought I had the article around here, um, did a, a, a news article about it, which was kind of cool. But uh, yeah, just over 400 days at this point. Here's a crazy idea. <laughs> so I do you, actually first, do you have a Twitter account? I do, uh, Gadget Nate. 
try tweeting Elon Musk every single day requesting an interview on this, like have a thing every day because someone recently for over a year was tweeting him every single day asking to use the branding of Cybertruck and SpaceX in the uh, Mars video game. And he finally applied after he replied after a year. So do you know what is, like, do you know what his reply was? something oh because he was asking to use the rights his replies was oh you can use that we probably won't sue you (laughs) it was hilarious (laughs) he finally replied about i think a couple weeks ago (laughs) and then not not exactly permission right it's it's uh it's uh we probably won't sue you yeah and then him replying to that after him trying over a year got international attention so if you're able to keep trying and garner that one reply, your project, I think, will really grow into the audience that it really needs to be. I wonder how many people, based on that article, are now uh, tweeting him daily. <laughs> I wonder, too. <laughs> you might have hundreds of people tweeting him every day at this point. Yeah, you never know. Well, that's definitely good. You mentioned uh, some tie-in between this and Space Hero. Um, hey, oh, what do you have in mind? Uh, what What do you think are some things that I should explore? The idea would be within a certain time frame. So you have this interviewing everyone once per day until the lunar landing. What if you create themes within some of those interviews where you start tying in the uncertain? things where this is someone from the space hero insider program and then maybe even because i know mentioned about if you email the i'm forgetting the lady's name the secretary if you email them some ideas because you're now in the insider program they'll consider it to see if you can get some of them interview eventually like even thomas and deborah i'm sure they'll be more than happy to at one point and then if you can get them to promote it and if you like a collaboration where it's branded with that as well can all of that's up to you what you want to do because this is your project then it could really take it to the next level because you're trying to do like an, an awareness thing yeah no that definitely be good yeah i reached out to uh deborah and, and thomas and um you know they said right now they're not doing any type of uh, media stuff so maybe once they announce the program and get past that they'd be more inclined um so that that would be that would be good um wow yeah no it, it, space heroes is really exciting also dear moon is another thing coming up right the sending the group of artists around the moon and the spacex rocket um and you know artemis it's going to be an interesting decade i think this is going to be uh, 2030 is going to look much different than than 10 years ago. I'm waiting for the day for Jimmy Donaldson, AKA Mr. Beast to announce. This will probably be like five, 10 years from now. Like, wait, me and my buddies are going to the moon and playing like a basketball game or something on the moon and make a video about it. And they were joking about it during the live stream, but they seemed like, ooh, we should do that one day. I'm like, that will be the day. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, uh, that is really something. Yeah, I talked to one guy. His dream is to uh, drink uh, bourbon on the moon in like 2035 or something like that. I think that's <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, very well. I uh, thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you around the Space Hero uh, ecosystem and uh, staying in touch and uh, seeing how your career progresses. Um, maybe you'll be building the habitats and the rovers and the the landers and the uh, orbital stations and the solar power farms and on and on and on. We'll have to definitely see. For me, I'm open to any of that. I was never expected to be part of a uh, TV production, <laughs> especially about one going to space, but you never know what life brings. Absolutely. Okay, well, be blessed and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. You too, Nathan. Bye-bye.